So in a cell, you have a compartment called the nucleus, which hosts or contains DNA, okay, which is the building block of everything um, uh, that we are made of. Surrounding the nucleus is a compartment called the endoplasmic reticulum. And I will come to that in a few minutes. And then we have this material, which we generally refer to as cytoplasm, which is then encased inside a membrane called the plasma membrane, okay? Now remember that this plasma membrane is a solid structure. Nothing can go across it. The only things that can go across this membrane are the gases. So if anything has to come out of this cell, it has to have a specific mechanism. They cannot simply leak out, nor can anything simply enter the cell. How are these proteins specifically transported from within the cell to the outs outside of the cell? George Pallotti, he was at Yale, and before that he was at Rockefeller in the US, and finally he moved to the University of California, San Diego, and he was a colleague of mine. He was the first person to look into the potential mechanism of protein secretion in the early 1970s. And he, in fact, basically came up with this model that proteins are transported between two compartments and secreted from the cells by means of small vesicles. So this is a picture taken um, from YouTube of transport of people moving in the city of Bangalore, I think, in India. And you see it's chaotic. There are people going in all different directions. And yet the city somehow works. These people know somehow where they need to go. The same thing is happening inside the cell. There is a chaos in the cytoplasm. And the question then becomes, how does a protein know that it has to be secreted? What is required for its secretion from the cells? And this brings us to the findings of Gunther Blobel, who is at Rockefeller University. He provided the first piece of evidence, which told us basically the minimum requirement that you have to have in order for your secretion from the cell. And this requirement is a special ticket called the signal sequence. So proteins that are made by the ribosomes, these little blobs, and I'll show you that in a second, that sit on the endoplasmic reticulum contain a signal sequence. And this ensures that they enter the endoplasmic reticulum. And this is where the general journey of a protein that is to be secreted begins. Okay, so how does it work? So this is a ribosome, this is what it looks like. This is a protein that is not completely made yet. As it comes out, it has a signal sequence. And if a protein contains a signal sequence, it can go only in one direction. And that is to bind to the endoplasmic reticulum. And if it binds to the endoplasmic reticulum, this is what happens, there's a channel in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is usually kept closed, okay? It is kept closed to prevent the movement of material from inside of the endoplasmic reticulum to the outside and of material from the outside, the cytoplasm, to the inside. So most of the time it's kept closed. But when a ribosome containing a protein with a signal sequence binds to this translocation channel, if you want to call it, as it is known, this structure is then pulled into, through this tunnel, into the lumen or the inside of the endoplasmic reticulum, as shown here. So you see the signal sequence is still bound, and this protein is somehow being threaded in. Once the protein is inside the compartment, which is the endoplasmic reticulum, an enzyme, shown here in yellow, comes along and cuts it. It's literally like a scissor. It cuts it such that the signal sequence is now inside the tunnel, whereas the protein is released into the medium. So now once the protein is inside the endoplasmic reticulum, it has only two fates. It can stay inside the endoplasmic reticulum or leave. The distinction between leaving and departure is understood to some extent, but not fully. But suffice to say that there are most of the proteins that enter the endoplasmic reticulum usually end up leaving the ER, meaning they don't live in the endoplasmic reticulum permanently. About 5,000 odd proteins le leave the endoplasmic reticulum, and that's a lot of material. So this is the endoplasmic reticulum in green, so it's a network of membranes that fill up the whole cell. And within this network are special domains, 
or regions, which are called the ER exit sites. So the proteins that have to leave the endoplasmic reticulum must be collected in these areas. Once the proteins have been collected into the ER exit site, there's a very complicated reaction which results in the formation of transport vesicles. And I'm showing you here a picture of cop 2 coated vesicles. There are three kinds of vesicles that have been identified in cells. clothrin coated vesicles, cop one coated vesicles, and cop 2 coated vesicles shown here. cop one vesicles are vesicles that I had purified when I was a postdoc at Stanford. I couldn't find a decent picture, so I'm just showing you cop 2 coated vesicles. They look the same. So this is what these vesicles look like. We can purify them from cells. And once we can purify, once we have pure vesicles, we can look at their makeup, their biochemical makeup. We can ask, what are the components of these vesicles? And once we know the components, we can then start to understand what is their function in the whole process of the formation of these transport carriers. I show you here animation of how we think this process works. So this is formation of a transport vesicle. Okay. It will undergo cutting here, and you have separated. So this is a transport vesicle, which contains cargo that needs to be taken out of the endoplasmic reticulum. And in this vesicle, the red are the cargos, the proteins that need to be transported. The blue structures are the receptors which bind to the cargo and take them into the vesicles. Adaptins are proteins that link this receptor to the structure which makes the vesicle. And this is a three-dimensional, 3D version of how we think this process works. And this is a picture. Uh, you can find this on YouTube, by the way. Okay? And it's the work, a lot of this is, uh, a lot of people were involved in this, but this movie, the animation is done by Tommy Kirkhausen and colleagues. So this is a simple, the single subunit of that coat which is required for the formation of these vesicles. And you'll see how it assembles, how complicated this process is. And we know about this because we know what these vesicles are made of. We know the independent, the subunits of these vesicular structures. So you see how this structure is assembling. This is, of course, done in a test tube, but the same reaction would be going on at the surface of a membrane, the endoplasmic reticulum. And in the end, you end up with something that looks like a bucky ball. And the compartment they come to is called the Golgi complex. How does a vesicle that leave the endoplasmic reticulum know it has to go to the Golgi? This is a key question that we need to address. But for the time being, the vesicle has arrived at the Golgi, and this is what the Golgi membranes look like. So if you look at the cells by light microscopy, and we think that this is by far the best picture of what the Golgi looks like. For the sake of convenience, I usually show Golgi to be something like this. We can pr project Golgi as a, you know, a stack of tortillas, if you want to call it, okay? plates. Okay? So the proteins enter the Golgi from one face, the cis face, if you want to call it, and they somehow move from one plate to the other one. They entered here, and they are now going sequentially from this cisterna to this one, from here to this one, and from here to this one. And when they come to the very last compartment of the Golgi, which is generally called the trans-Golgi network, okay, something magical happens inside this compartment. This is the real post office of a cell. 